three o'clock in time for our group of the week. This week, I have two groups, the Paragon and the Jesters. Although either one of these groups ever had a big hit, they did record some beautiful dollars. And we'll start off with the Paragon. Yeah, you might not know, but here at the shop we listen to John Brodak, real famous DJ. Real f in fact, there's a little known fact, before we get into the video, that Howard Stern tried to hire John Brodak at one time, but John said he'd rather be supplying the world with great model plane parts. John, you made the right choice. And before we get into the video, I wanted to make a special thanks to John Brodak. We kid around, have a lot of fun with John, and I guess that's really the whole purpose of doing this to begin with, but mainly, mainly, number one, we have a brand new plane. It's a prototype of the Brodak Cardinal. We want to get the actual trim and flight trim and whatever else is going to happen. It'll probably crash on a second flight or whatever. We want to get it all documented on video. And by the way, John, batting 500 is not too bad. I used to bat 650, but I lied. Now every year this time it's nice to reach up into the rack, take out a plane that's never even had fuel in it, and make the preparation on it. And we're going to try to do this all on this tape in a very clearly defined way that may help you, hopefully help you trim whatever plane you decide to fly. The rules of trim generally apply to most aeroplanes. And the first determination with any new plane that's never been flown, the first thing I like to establish, and this is how I reference off, all of the references come from the hinge line. And I want to know my reference from the hinge line forward to where the plane actually balances. And I want to do this real accurately. And what I want to try to establish is that the plane is either nose heavy, or tail heavy. Now if, if you have a typical design that's been proven and flown and you go back and forth over several that have been flown already, you would have a real good idea of where you want the CG to be. But since this is a prototype, we don't know. So we're going to take a mean average, we're going to average out the wing cord and take 15%. And 15% of the wing, I want to have the hinge line 15% from the leading edge back. That would give me this dimension here. It would be 15% of the mean average cord. Oh, since I don't know this, I don't know if I'm going to want to fly the plane at 15%, 20%, 18%, I don't know yet. I'm going to start at a safe thing. And all trim on new planes should probably start at a very safe thing. So to make it safe, I want to be on the heavy side. That means when I balance the plane at 15% of the mean average quarter of the wing, I want to see either a perfect balance or I want to see the nose slightly going down. What I don't want to see is that the nose drops instantly down, that it's going to be so nose heavy, it's going to be out of trim, and even worse than that, that it's going to be terribly tail heavy. Now usually you can determine ahead of time, before you even do the test, if you have a plane that's over the acceptable weight, in this case our prototype came out to be 42 ounces, so it might even be a right at in the middle or on the light side, but if it tended to be heavy, anytime a plane tends to be heavy, it tends to also be tail heavy, it tends to be over painted. 
Usually, almost every time that somebody winds up with a plane that's tail heavy and heavy, these three kind of go together. Now, the, the combination that really works well is if you can build light without trading away any of the structure, the plane will usually come out nose heavy. Usually planes that are monocoated because they, they do have less total weight and most of the weight is behind the center of gravity, monocoated planes tend to come out on the light side and they tend to be nose heavy. So knowing this ahead of time, this gives us a good chance at knowing where we're going with the basic balance. Now just as an example, some of the things, the choices that you want to make early on is you want to do this preliminary little balance job. A safe, uh, as I said, you could do this one of two ways. You can look at, let's use a nobler as an example. You could use the nobler and say, well, my plane is nose heavy. What are some of the choices? If it's really nose heavy, some of the choices you can make. A lighter spinner. A lot of the plastic spinners are a lot lighter. In some cases, even changing the wheels will be enough. But the biggest one you really want to consider is in the motor. The muffler on the motor, if you're using the muffler that comes with the motor, that can tend to be heavy. And you can put an aftermarket muffler or tongue muffler on. These are three things that you can use that it, and I would start with the one in, as far forward in the plane as possible to get the balance real close to where the, either the plans call for it or if you don't know or if it's a prototype you can just use 15 percent of the mean average core to the wing but I always like to reference from the hinge line forward. If I don't have a CG, I like to reference forward. If I have a CG, and most planes that have been developed and several have been built, now we'll know real soon, once we get some flying in, where this design is going to want to have its CG. And we'll obviously make that part of the final plan that goes into the kit. But right now it's still kind of an unknown thing. But since we did put a very thin finish on, usually if you calculate the square inches of area behind the center of gravity as opposed to the front, you'll find out that on most designs it's a lot more and it has a lot longer leverage arm back by the tail. So that this amount, if we were looking at a plane that was real nose heavy, really extremely nose heavy, sometimes you have to resort to things like making a brass tail wheel or in some cases you'll notice some of the super expert flyers they wrap solder on their tail wheel in my case a lot of the planes that built the planes have a hatch for adjusting the controls and I can put a little bit of lead inside or attach to the door but being able to go back and forth because what you're going to find out with any design is that there's going to be a real nice CG where if this CG gets further and further back the plane doesn't want to track and level flight it doesn't want to hold bottoms when it's real nose heavy it's going to have a real soft mushy corner back here one indication always a ballpark indication that you're tail heavy as soon as the motor quits the tail drops and the plane doesn't want to glide it doesn't want to land real nice but you have to determine this to suit your flying skill the only thing another person can do is get you in the ballpark like what we're trying to do now is get this we certainly don't want to take a brand new plane out that's balanced way tail heavy or way nose heavy we want to try to get it and that's what will help most people most of the time is if you don't have a CG on the plans roughly calculate out 15 percent of the wing it's real easy to do you really need to spend this time and I over over emphasize this a new plane I've gone out with many people over the years that have taken a brand new plane it was totally tail heavy and almost crashed on the first flight or couldn't even land it it just hobby horses around now it's a tremendous help if somebody has already designed a plane built many prototypes came up with what they feel is a real good average point it'll be on the plans like this it's probably one of the most significant things on the whole plans but if you don't have that again it's always safer to be a little on the nose heavy side than on the tail heavy side well, one of the things you really need unless you're out on your own designing your own plane the number one thing again 
over and over I'll say this is you need to know where that CG is. You need to plot that CG. You need to know where it is because everything we're going to do that's of significance is going to reference off of that center of gravity. Without that, you're just throwing darts in the dark. Now the second step, once we know the center of gravity, we want to put the mean average point of the leadouts, and you can see that that references, take a look at the, the center of gravity, I have to do this from far away because the plans are so large, everything, even the leadout rake references off the center of gravity, which then references off the hinge line. Those two parallel lines, I know my hinge line is going to be a straight parallel line. Now obviously this would not work if we had a design with a swept forward hinge line. But I think all modern designs have a, a straight hinge line. So that hinge line becomes the reference point and I want to measure up and I want to find my mean average point where the two leadouts are coming out of the wing. Now I don't care where the front one is or the back one. I don't care if they're close together or far apart. I want to know the mean average. The mean average means the center of where the two are because I want the center to be between an inch and an inch and a half and these are just general start at the ballpark in the middle trim places an inch and a half from the center of gravity the mean average from the center of gravity an inch and a half back is a really really excellent place to start your trim now we've already determined our place our sent our center of gravity and we've taken an inch and a half again set the leadouts just the starting point as the leadouts go further back the plane will get more and more stable generally have just a little bit more line tension as the leadouts come forward the plane is going to have a little bit less tension it's going to also tend to turn a little bit sharper and have a little bit less stability inherent stability as these go back you make the plane more and more stable as you move the leadouts forward, it gets more and more violent in the turn. And can tend to be, at some given point, way far forward, it can tend to be downright unstable. Again, we're not doing a razor fine tuning of 60 fourths of an inch or custom tuning it to one pilot. What I'm trying to do is give everybody that, that possibly has built this type of plane a little idea of just what I'm going to go through on the first couple of flights to try to get a feel and a trim that's pretty much ballpark and basic for me and then I can use that hopefully incorporate all those numbers onto the plans or into a future video that somebody can use to trim their own plane to their own personal style this is the ballpark though now given the fact that you have established a CG and you've got your leadouts roughly in position. The two next things to check are the offsets, the variable offset. In this case, we don't have a variable rudder. If we needed one, we could always make a tab out of a little piece of aluminum or tin. We also want to dial in the motor offset. Now, I've started with absolutely zero. I'm going to work my way from zero out rather than work from too much offset in. I would say a best place to start is to start right from zero and if you need a little more line tension then adjust the offset now I always I always feel one of the best things you can do is start the test that you want to make is you want to put on a propeller now in my case I like to take a 12 inch propeller and always reference off a of one blade and they make a completely parallel line lay a ruler here Similar to this, lay a ruler from the tip of that prop blade, mark it, take that exact same prop blade and flip it over and put that same mark over here. Now when you do that, you want to see this number be bigger by an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch if you choose to put some offset in a plane. But the real reason for testing it, if these are perfectly equal, then you're starting at zero. And that's what we're going to do with this plane is start at zero. But a lot of people have trouble figuring out how much offset. Well, an eighth to a quarter of an inch is a good ballpark number for offset. Now granted, there are many, many top world-class flyers. Zhang Dung, for instance, when he was the world champion, 
had a very light plane with an engine that was offset seven degrees. Most people have a lot less offset. I think one or two degrees is a good average. But it's always good in this case to start at zero. We can add offset. There's adjustable offset pads you can buy right from John Brodeck that'll fit the plane perfectly on the first shot. It's better to use offset pads than washers. Washers tend to sink into the motor mounts and, and screw things up a bit, especially if you have plywood doublers. But the two situations you would like to have is that these are equal. When you measure this dimension and this dimension from the same prop blade, it's dead equal, and that would be zero. And if the numbers are different, an oversimplification is to have the number on the inside of the circle be bigger by an eighth to a quarter. I think more than a quarter of an inch, I don't think you really need more than a quarter of an inch. I think it's just overkill when you do that. Now also, if you have an adjustable rudder, this plane doesn't have one. It doesn't have one yet. It may have one before the end of the day. I would say a good place to start is to leave the rudder offset typically a quarter of an inch. If you have a ray rudder, you'd like it to go back almost to zero and then go out into maybe eight or ten degrees of travel. That's a whole other topic. That We could make a whole video just about that, but if you have a, a rudder that's glued in place or one that's on a ball link, you'd like to start with about a quarter of an inch of offset. And this combination, now see, as you get into trim things, here's what you find out is a lot of things, for instance, a nose-heavy plane. You see a lot of people have a nose-heavy plane. And their planes tend to have a certain set of circumstances, a large handle, big diameter props. Certain things fit a nose-heavy plane. Certain things, concessions can be made to a tail-heavy plane to make it work. But the object is to get a ballpark reading to get the plane right from the beginning, especially when it's a prototype, to get all these numbers into a coordinated package so that somebody who builds this plane, if, especially if they're not a high skill level person, has a real good shot at getting it to fly the first time and fly well. And I think the combination of the CG being at 15%, the lead out's an inch to an inch and a half back. If we had a rudder, and if you don't, just leave it at zero. Now what happens, these are things that work in combination. If you have a variable rudder, you can affect in effect, use less motor offset and use the rudder to create that outward yaw. If you have no adjustable rudder, we'll use the motor as a variation. In fact, on the new Spitfire that we're building, we don't have adjustable leadout, so we'll have to compensate by having a lot of other adjustable ways of dialing in our outline tension. Now, on any new plane, this determines the vertical. center of gravity, the vertical CG. And what you want to try to do is get a plumb bob. A plumb bob is nothing more than a weight tied to an end of a string. Hang it somewhere where it's convenient to hang the plane by a little bit of a wire or a hoop from the leadouts, and the string side by side. And what you want to do is take your eyeball and run your eyeball so you can see that string going right through the wing. And almost every time you do that, you're going to find out the plane is just a little bit that yawed out or a little bit yawed in. It's almost never right on the money. And you can fine tune it this way. If the bottom side, the landing gear side, needs to be a little heavier, you can add a little lead into the wheel pants. You can add heavier wheels. You can make the wheels longer. That'll kind of bring it back into perfect position. If it's the other way around, now the choice is you need to use lighter wheels or get the wheels closer up to the body or make some other change. For instance, in Joe Adamusco's case, he one time added a little lead sinker to the tip of the rudder to bring it back into vertical CG. Now, it a plane will tolerate a certain amount of being out in the vertical CG. It can be out of half a degree or whatever, but if it's radically out, then you really want to make that correction. You want to make that correction before you ever fly the plane. The reason for that is, if this vertical CG is not correct, what's going to happen is your flap tweak is going to wind up wrong and incorrect. And you'll have one Band-Aid cover another Band-Aid cover another Band-Aid another. And before you know it, you have a box of Band-Aids instead of a good flying plane. So once all those early things are done, getting the vertical CG real close, and by the way, this plane worked out almost right on the money when I plumb bobbed it. It really did pan out to be just about perfect. And, I, and most of that is luck. And when we luck out, every once in a while, it's, it's really a miracle. 
most of the time though a plane will need an adjustment to the landing gear, the weights. Another way Bob Barron has a good way of doing it is he moves the lead outs up and down in a wing. It, that's kind of inconvenient in most cases, but if you take a plumb bob, it's real easy to do, and you get it to go right through the center of that wing. Again, even if it's off an eighth or a sixteenth of an inch, the reason it's a problem is then you have to compensate for that with a flap tweak, and let me explain that. Here's the situation when a plane is top heavy. And what happens, here's the plane, it's wanting to fly this way, but the top of the plane is heavier than the bottom, so it tends to want to push this wing down. The centrifugal force coming out, this is going to want to tend to do this. Now, by making the wheels a little bit heavier, you can see what really happens. It'll bring it back into equilibrium. Now, what most people do, and it's incorrect. What they'll do is if they have the vertical CG wrong, they'll take one of two things and do a flap tweak and make this flap go down, this flap go up, or both, to try to compensate for the vertical CG being out. So before you did any flap tweaking, either way, now just reverse this, if the plane had the wheels were being too heavy, what would happen is the plane would fly that way to a certain amount, almost an undetectable amount. You'll usually notice this in outside rounds and outside loops. If a plane is real light on outside rounds, what's really happening? Here's the situation. You're on outside rounds and the plane is top heavy. So what happens is you, you tweak a flap when what you really should be doing is adjusting the weight of the wheels. So just knowing that this is gonna, these two things are gonna dovetail together. And I know this stuff can get redundant and boring. That's why it's it boring, especially. Imagine how boring it is when nobody teaches you this and you have to learn it on your own. What happens is a lot of trim factors work in conjunction with others. Now, the best one I've ever seen is the one Paul Walker wrote in Flying Models. And excellent. It's a flow chart. And anybody that deals with computers knows you can just go through it. And that's a good way to do it. This is a good way to do it. There's a lot of good ways to trim plane. There's not, it just like building wings or any other phase of modeling, there's a lot of good ways to do it. This is a very simple, straightforward way that should get you right into the ballpark before that plane ever has a set of lines hooked up to it. So here the plane is sitting there on the floor and you're itching to go flying and the spring is breaking or if you're in California, it's spring all the time or whatever and you're dying to go flying. But you need to take and do a little bit of a check, at least I think it's a good investment, do a first flight checklist. Get the CG right or a bit nose heavy. Get the vertical CG right. Get your motor at dead zero or one to two degrees of offset good starting point. Have your lead out adjustment an inch to an inch and a half to find the center of gravity. Now pull test up a new set of lines and handle. And my guess is, if you're in doubt, if you don't know what line length, like this plane, we don't know if it's going to wind up on 61 feet, 62 feet. Short is better than long. So I'll make the first set of lines up maybe a foot or two shorter than probably what will be the ultimate trim lines. If you have a 40, you can use 015s. Anything bigger than a 40, it's going to have to fly on 018s or solids. Now, probably the biggest one. The biggest one that kills. I've seen, probably in all my, my many wonderful years of modeling, I've seen more planes, more motors destroyed on the first flight. What typically happens is you take a brand new motor, a brand new tank, a brand new filter, a brand new, put it in a plane and go flying. In this case, we've already flushed the tank. We made a little alteration by putting the tank brackets on. But we also need to take the plane and ground run it. And the reason is when the vibration in the motor is going to tend to loosen things up in the tank, you're really, you're really fooling yourself if you think all this stuff is going to work on the first shot. Also, it's a really good idea to get, if the motor, in this case, this motor needs very little break, and so we'll run it two, three times on the ground, but get it running in the plane before it ever gets launched. Go around the whole plane and tighten all the bolts. Tightening all the bolts, the motor mount bolts, the muffler. 
I've at least seen five planes that you, you take off and within three laps the, the muffler is rattling and it flies off and hits somebody in the head. What happens is when things are new, the bolts tend not to seat. You tighten them and after they heat and expand, especially the motor, they can use a little extra tightening. Before the plane gets airborne, you should always run it on the ground three, four, five times even. The more the better and then tighten everything up, check everything. boy this is a big one free controls I've seen a lot of people especially newcomers they get out to the field there's so much paint in the hinges you can hardly move the controls up and down a little WD-40 the night before you're gonna go flying in the hinges let it sit work the controls back and forth until they're nice and free or find what's binding what's binding find it and and test it get it out of the get it out of your system a little WD-40 is a good idea before you ever go flying, though. Free controls. Free is such an such a, an important thing on a new plane, especially if it's a little tail heavy. It's gonna it, it's gonna never stabilize. The free controls you can't overemphasize on a new plane. Sit at the bench or sit at the field even and work the controls until everything is free. Scrape all the paint out of the hinges. And because we're going to fly this in the next couple of days, or this weekend maybe, I take some chain lube even. This is chain lube. It comes out, motorcycle chain oil. I go through right through all the hinges. I'll let this sit overnight. I can let this sit right on the hinges. Now it comes out as a liquid, but it solidifies to a grease. It's just ordinary motorcycle chain oil. This is Bell Ray PJ1 is a good brand. Now if I let that sit there overnight, it'll it'll pretty much disappear and all that'll be left is a little bit of grease. And that grease will free the controls up and make the first flight a lot more fun. And these are pretty free, but you never have controls that are too free. I have to tell you what I had <laughs> when I say wheels free spinning, many times, especially if you've soldered on a wheel and you haven't touched the plane in a while, the solder and flux will freeze up around the wheel and you haven't oiled it and you go to take off and that wheel is binding and tr you just break a prop. Oh, check that the wheels are free spinning and in that same vein, balance the prop. And after the ground running, I mean we're just getting into things that they would make common sense, but it's good to have a checklist. When you're a new guy in a hobby, you need a checklist. You, you, you don't need a lot of people criticizing you and trying to intimidate you. What you need is somebody to take the time and do this, either either to physically come out to the field and help you or have a video available that you, that'll make your day at the flying field a little more fun and a little less tragic. And a clean filter. I know you're probably saying, why didn't you go to art school instead of flying school? Now a good idea is after you bench run an engine four or five six times, take the filter, flush it if it's, per and run whatever's in there into a paper towel so you can see. And if it's perfectly clean, now well, back flush it back and forth, put it back whatever. But but ultimately you want to wind up with a clean filter or an even better just before the plane actually goes airborne, put a new filter on it. That would even be cheap, even cheaper insurance. And the other, the other good idea is look for a decent day. I mean, try to pick what you hope is going to be, you know, a reasonably decent day, not a windy day. Try to get out to the field early, have a cup of coffee so you're in a good mood. If you can, get some expert level flyers, come out and give you a hand. With all the time and energy you put into a plane, it's a shame not to do some of these things. The real shame in life is that the people all around you may need just five minutes of your time, and when you learn this stuff, get busy helping other people. Now, this is a really good tip, and Lou Dutka, this is a picture of Lou Dutka at the 86 Nats. He was, I think, the fifth place guy, I'm not sure. He was in the top five anyway. 
And Lou had a really neat trim idea. Lou used to build the same plane over and over, basically the Matrix Eagle design. It was an excellent design. One of the things Lou did that I thought was just a great idea is he would take the motor, the muffler, the tank, the tubing, the filter, everything, and the tank shim, right out of the plane from the previous year. It already had hundreds of flights on it. It was already dialed in. The prop, not the prop, everything and just put it right into his new plane. Now a lot of times when you can take advantage of all of the things that you've learned from the previous year, especially the tank shim, the head gaskets, the muffler settings, the pro all of this you would bolt right into his new plane and the first day at the field he'd basically only have to deal with the trim of a new airframe, not everything from the firewall forward. An excellent, excellent way to do it. Now here's one of the smartest, smartest kids I have ever known, Matt Gifford. And what made him so special is they lived all the way up in New Bedford, Massachusetts, and every time he'd have a new plane, he'd basically come all the way down to Flushing, he'd bring his father, and he'd get Big Jim out at the field, and Mike Rogers and myself, and get four or five experts, and get everybody to trim his plane out for him. And that was such an excellent way to do it. It, it was just so easy. If you can rope somebody into helping you, it goes without saying, that's the best tip of all. I'm just going to add in a couple of random tips that I think are worth mentioning. This is an old plane Frank McMillan laid, made that was a copy of the wing and tail from a Lou Dutka plane. Now one of the things, and again, sometimes these things slip right over your head, but, but worth mentioning. What he did, it, after the Nats was over, he had Lou Dutka fly his plane and say, well, gee whiz, how do you like the way mine is set up relative to yours? And what happens when you do that, now, for instance, Rudy Ryback and I both have identical Brodak Cardinals. If I fly his and he flies mine, we can both learn from each other. That's always a good way to do it, is try to, try. I mean, within reason, you don't want to become Mr. Cowboy Low Bottoms, but if you can learn from somebody else who's basically flying and developing the same size plane, it's a good way to do it. Now here's another thought, very significant thought. I know a lot of people that when they have a trim problem with a plane and it requires cutting the airplane and they've spent 2,000 hours buffing and they don't want to cut at it. Well, I got to tell you, I don't either. This was at the 87 Nats. You can see Bozo here, his name is on his shirt. And what happened, I had landed inverted. And right out on the flying field, luckily this was right after they did the concourse judge, and I had landed, I had to make a new rudder right out on the field, and you can see how much carving and sanding had to be done. This was old tradition. And we won the concourse that year, so it was worth it in terms of the judging was already over. But, but my point is not to be afraid if a plane needs a trim adjustment, or a rudder, or, or a tab, or something, not to be afraid that you're taking your new baby and you're going to destroy it. I want to mention I want to mention this for one reason. This is Joe Ortiz, by the way. Joe was out at the field the first day he ever flew this plane. He says, Wendy, Wendy, fly my plane. There's something wrong with it. There's something wrong with it. And I flew the plane, and I realized he had no up control. And what had happened, he had built the plane with the push rod, had no fair lead inside the body. And if I remember, this is the one. And so what happens now is if you can get an expert to help you trim your plane or even take a couple flights on it, I'm sure most people are more than happy to do this with, what happened, we determined within a flight or two that the plane needed a fair lead. Cut it apart, went back to his apartment, put the fair lead on, the whole plane was brand new. But had he not done that, it would only be a matter of time before you get frustrated or you try doing other trim things that don't work or in the worst of all scenarios, you crash the plane. Now, in keeping with what I just said, this, of course, is Lou McFarlane. And by the way, this is one of the original sharks. I saw Lou do something that I was really impressed with. And we're going to get into this in a, very f in a few minutes. This is a Shark 45, and it had unequal panels, meaning the inboard wing was bigger than the outboard wing. Now, that's one of the ways of designing a plane right from scratch, but it requires a little bit of different trim, and we're going to get into that real soon. But what Lou had done on one of the Sharks is he had trimmed the flaps down to make the flap. I think Bob Gieske even did this. 
where I looked out on the wing and he had three or four different times he fine-tuned the plane by cutting the flaps. And the bottom line was not to be afraid to make these trim changes if you know they're going to work or you have a good chance at making them work. Not just point blank not to be afraid to make them. And by the way, I just want to congratulate Lou on his indoctrination, induction, indoctrination. What? Do I know English? Into the Hall of Fame. Lou, I'll tell you, when I was a kid, I loved your Shark 45s. And you know what? I love them now. Lou, I'm impressed. Still one of the nicest guys in stunt. Just want to take a second and congratulate this guy, too, on his indoctrination. Boy, I this is great. Big Art, hey. Uh, I don't know the other two inductees personally, but these two guys definitely get the windy seal of approval. By the way, is that George Aldrich drinking something here? That isn't soda, is it, George? Nah, gotta be, gotta be seltzer water. I want to mention one of my other theories is the theory of changing balance. And what will happen a lot of times people will have a ship and let's say for instance this particular plane winds up being tail heavy well what they wind up doing when it's tail heavy they wind up number one adding nose weight yeah don't know if I like that number two adding a heavy a heavier muffler or another muffler or another motor but basically they're adding weight well I think it's a little more work, but a better way to do it, and it's the way I've chosen, is the minus way. Try to, if a plane at all possible, try to start maybe at the flap hinge line back, and especially on the bottom, in the bottom of the stab. Buff this much of the paint to remove paint to get the CG that you're looking for. And I think as a general rule, it's always better to take some material off to achieve balance than to add. Adding is always, to me, the wrong direction. If possible, of course there's limits to this. You can't do this indefinitely, but if you have a reasonable choice, always better, always better. My favorite thing is to take all the paint, even going through the ink lines on the bottom of the stab of some of these planes, because you don't see that. This area down here, you really don't see that. Even the judges don't see it. Hell, I've won a concourse with planes that had no paint back there, and they never even saw it. But basically, here's the, here's the whole thing. Is taking weight off to achieve trim is always better in my book than putting weight on. It's, it's like life in general is better than putting weight on. Something that I find real easy to do. Now, I said I'd touch on equal and unequal trim. Basically, there's two ways to do this. And whichever way you favor, I guess, is a personal choice item. Many of the really good designs, classic designs of all time, have a bigger inboard wing. This is called an unequal panel wing design. Some of, not all of, modern planes, certainly not all of them, have... Now the 51 Cardinal is an example of a plane that had unequal wing panels. Paul Walker's plane has them. There's two ways of looking at this. Now this plane will carry less tip weight. This, this design will generally carry more tip weight. So you want to be aware of right at the beginning that a plane with unequal panel wings is going to wind up carrying less tip weight. An equal panel plane like the Brodak Cardinal will carry typically carry more tip weight. And for a beginner, there's some advantage in that in a plane that you would think the plane would have the more tip weight you have, the more line tension. But these planes can be trimmed the same way. It's not a contest to see whose way is right or wrong, but rather to find a way that you're comfortable and happy dealing with. And if you know these circumstances ahead of time, this this will allow you to try both and then pick one that you feel is going to suit your needs. An unequal plane typically will have two different size flaps. An equal panel plane will have perfectly even flaps. And in this case, a lot of times what they'll do is change the dimension in some way of the outboard flap to compensate. And again, I remember seeing Lou McFarland's plane, Bob Geeske's plane, experimenting with 
various differences in flaps. But always, a, a smoothie is a good example. Always remember, an unequal plane is going to have an unequal size outboard flap, less tip weight. An equal panel plane will typically, not always, but typically have equal flaps and be able to carry, if you find that a desirable thing, more tip weight. Again, the best way to do this is to build one plane from each school of thought and find which one suits your needs the best. The Brodak Cardinal is an equal plane. The Nobler, the Brodak Nobler is an unequal plane. So in theory, you should go buy a Brodak Nobler or a Brodak Cardinal. Try both ways until you find a way that you're happy with. Now what had happened years ago is I had basically built pretty much identical planes and made one with a bigger inboard wing an inch bigger and one equal. And I found that for my fly-in style, I kind of preferred the fact that it carried the extra tip weight. But a lot of people that flew the plane, other expert models said, oh man, this has so much line tension. Well, again, not, not to make it an overstatement, but I felt that for my needs, the equal panel plane was good. But then when I went and designed the 51 Cardinal, I wanted to downsize the plane, and because the plane was smaller, I wanted to try having a bigger inboard wing by an inch. So again, I've tried both ways and I've made the decision for myself, but you should do the same thing. Rather than take anybody's word for it, always try both yourself. And that holds true in terms of motors, flying, flying style, solid lines, paint the plane with candy paint, everything. Try it and find what suits you the best. And one of the things that I like to start with on any given plane is get the tank shim real close on the first try. On the directions that came with the tank brackets, they were suggesting that the tank on a profile would be mounted a quarter of an inch higher, an eighth per quarter inch higher. But in a, in a full-size plane where the motor is upside down, I always like to start with maybe a sixteenth of an inch shim under the tank that usually gets you a ballpark reading. Now, by flying the plane, there's a lot of ways to do the trim on this. This this is probably one of the easiest ways to do it, is to time three laps in level flight. It's always easy to do three laps, and this is the basic oversimplification, but it'll help you get that first initial thing. Let's say the first, just to make a number up, those laps are 15 seconds. Now you want to flip the plane over on its back and fly at the same height. If you fly at a different height, it doesn't, it doesn't really make for a good test. And time three laps. Have you ever have your helper, or if you can, do it at the same time. And you want to determine now, am I going faster or slower? So the determination is going to be, do you want to raise the tank or lower the tank? You want to make that determination based on, this is a good place, this is not really the ultimate way to do it, but to, to get started, to get a ballpark setting on everything, this is a good way to do it. Now if you want to, we always have to, have to be careful because this is like a flap tweak, it's very easy to reverse things. It, picture that the fuel is in the tank, and this will make it very easy to figure out. There's a fuel head, what's called a fuel head, it's the pressure. If I take this tank and move it up this way, fuel is going to go into the motor a lot faster. If I move the tank down this way and starve the motor for fuel, boy, just maybe one drop is going to get up to the engine. So what I want to determine now is what do I really want to do with this? The plane is flying. Do I want it to go faster in this mode or slower? Let's say I want the motor to slow down in level flight. Well, that means I want to raise this, in effect, putting more fuel into the engine. If it's going too slow and I want to speed it up, I want to lower the tank. And in a full body plane, that would be putting shims in. Or if you have those neat little Brodak ears, and those ears that we soldered onto the tank, I can do that on a profile real easily. But know what the theory is. The theory is when you raise this amount of fuel, it's going to want to pour into the engine. 
as you move it away from the engine down it's going to be tend not to go into the engine as quickly and run leaner you'd be amazed how many people don't really don't really have a good concept of how that works remember just remember the old Roy how I said a lot of these things intermix well now picture in in an extreme case when the vertical CG or a flap tweak is off it in effect it alters where the fuel is in the tank so if that's not flying straight it's pointless to shim the tank because you're going to have to compensate for this variation every time you change the way the plane flies on the end of the lines you're in effect changing the tank shim so you want this is the reason I'm going back now to these original things to see how important it is to kind of set up a sequence of things that make sense early on rather than just a stab in the dark approach you wouldn't want to set the tank shim now you tweak the flap and you got to retreat it's like double and triple and quadruple work so you always want to get the wing level as a primary thing before you go into s any of the work of shim in a tank that holds true by the way of tweaking flaps also every flap tweak is going in some way affect the tank shim even if just slightly it's going to affect it now that little tank adjustment even though we've started you can see the tank is slightly higher center line of the tank slightly higher than the glow plug but you can see we've left plenty of the adjustment on those little copper guys and we're really we're really hoping that we'll be close on the first flight and again that's another thing is to get everything real close so that the plane is easy to fly and comfortable you're nervous enough having a new plane you don't need to have a tank flying off or a glow plug breaking a filter clogging a oh, the million things that can happen now in that same vein let me suggest another thing any first flights should always be a little bit on the rich side because you never never really want to have that dead lean run that eats an engine early on once a tank has 50 flights on it typically not much stuff is going to come out of it but in the beginning it can be a real problem now the fuel you use constitutes a big part of trimming the plane let me just go through this for all purposes 99 percent of the people are going to wind up using five or ten percent those two blends i personally like the fuel taffender makes which is pa blend it's a pa blend five and ten percent would be my two choices now fine tuning with fuel is a lot easier than you think so it's always a good idea to have some ten percent and five percent for whatever conditions are going to come up but you always want to know what are the conditions what's going to happen if i change fuel if I have 5% and I go to 10, the run is going to be shorter. It's going to use its fuel a little bit quicker. The reason is, is you'll always wind up getting less mileage with 10% than 5%. That's a given. So to know which direction, let's say you have a plane and it runs out of gas at the square eight. Well, you know you don't go to more nitro, you go to less. That's one of the scenarios. Just a rough idea of something you should have in having your knowledge bank to use now I'll make another scenario up you want a little more power the planes wimpy and weak on a hot day yeah you'll get more power assuming you have a big enough tank 10 percent will give you more power but the trade-off is that you get more heat so a lot of times on a really blazing hot day you don't want to take this motor that's on the razor edge already you could run the risk of overheating the engine when you go and if certainly if you go to anything more than 10 percent fuel you'll get more and more power as you had nitro but you you in effect make more heat you lose the motor run and the power that you make is really not generated in a way that you can take full advantage of it but there is a couple little quirks here that allow let's just say you want to run a little bit of a bigger prop you want to run a little more diameter well 10% is good when you're using big props, that's for sure. When you're using regular props, I prefer 5. But again, we're going to be working with this K&B 40, 
and we hope sooner or later we're going to have a K and B60 to test. But having these two blends around, now what this allows you to do is fine tune the mileage. It allows you to fine tune the power. For instance, if the plane on 10% is going just a little bit too fast and you want to cut back the power, you can just switch the fuel without even touching the plane. If the plane is showing you some sign that it's overheating, typically if at the end of the flight it sounds like there's a loose ball bearing in a muffler and it's, it's rattling, it's probably overheating, especially if you have a muffler that's too restrictive. So having these choices, this just gives you a really, really rough ballpark idea of where you are in terms of the fuel that you're going to use and what you can do to make the run longer or shorter, more or less power, dealing with more or less heat, and to turn a bigger or a smaller prop. What happens if you run no nitro fuel? Out at this end of the spectrum, there's no nitro fuel. And what will happen, a motor typically runs real cool. I've never gotten really nice consistent runs with that's known as FAI fuel. And up in the 12 and 15 percent, 12, 15, I'm, I imagine some other people have even run 20. What happens, mileage is so bad that you wind up needing a, a 10 ounce tank in a plane. Now here's, here's a typical thing a lot of people don't take into consideration. When you take off with a plane, the takeoff, the CG is probably right on the spot that you are accustomed to trimming the plane to. But as you take the fuel that's in the tank and you start to burn and so off, this is a significant amount, and this is why I mention it right after the fuel, is you always really get two CG settings throughout a flight. When the tank is full, you're using the forward setting. When the tank is empty, you're back a significant way. And anytime you want to test that, you can go test it on your little CGO meter. You'll see it's quite a bit, depending, of course, on how much fuel you have in the tank. Now, I mentioned using 20% fuel just as a radical example, because what would happen is you would turn this plane into an oil tanker. You would have all this extra fuel to deal with. And as you're burning the fuel off, this plane is getting more and more tail heavy, more and more sensitive to the controls, to the point at which it all burns off and the motor shuts off. But w The reason you want to know this is you want to make a determination, especially with a new plane, if you're comfortable with the CG. So I always tell people, take off, forget about doing a stunt pattern, and fly some rounds and squares early in the pattern. Wait say a minute from the end of the flight, and obviously you don't want to do it right at the very end, and then do the same maneuvers at the, at the back end of the flight. And you'll notice, probably at the back end of the flight, the plane gets a lot more touchy, a lot more easy to pop square corners with, and up in the beginning of the flight, especially on a wing over pullout, it can, it can get real soft. Now you do a wing over at the end of the flight and it'll jump, it'll, it'll make you crazy. That's why it never pays to practice wing overs at the end of the flight, even though a lot of people do it. It, it gives you a false, a false turn. So you can maximize this by knowing that you should never make the tank any bigger than it has to be. If a motor will run comfortably on five ounces of fuel, why make it burn 10? I mean, there's just some, there's a little bit of common sense here. Second of all, you have to pay for the fuel. And then last of all, as if that wasn't a big enough kick in the buns, you got to wipe it off the plane. So I always feel the tank should never be any bigger than it has to be. You should never have be carrying around 9, 10 ounces of fuel just so you can run hot rod fuel. Not for a stunt run, anyway. And the other thing is that I've always found is the tank should be as close reasonably to the motor as possible. Having the tank way in the back, you don't get a stable motor run. A lot of funny things happen. The tank should always be as close to the motor, in theory, as close as possible, and shim so that you get an equal run upright and inverted. Well, another point I want to mention is I've had I have several planes that I'm able to change motors in very conveniently and easily. I like to experiment with motors, and I think the only downside of experimenting with any kind of motors is the fact that you can basically spend a lot of money and not make not make yourself uh, any happier than if you find something you really like and stick with it. But it's not the point. If you have the time and inclination to experiment with motors, it is a lot of fun and I've done it. I've run all the tune pipe motors that are available. I've run Foxes. One of the motors I haven't really run yet is the K&B.
Now just remember, I have never run a K and B, so I'm basically going to go by just my seat of the pants inclination as to what props to use. We're starting off with a five ounce tank. We want to have some variation in tanks. I want to try some different tanks. And the point is, very important point here, is if, if you're making a plane, it's just as easy to make a plane that you can switch motors in conveniently. And what that means is whatever the selection of motors that you have is, use the one that's the widest to build a plane if you intend to do a lot of motor testing. This makes it real easy for you later on down the road. Now this is just one good example, and I was looking for a good picture of a plane that, that would simulate what I wanted to show. This was a plane that at the time I built and flew this plane, I had a lot of choices of motors. I had a Rossi, I had an OPS, OS, V-Maxes, Super Tiger 60s, K and B 60s, the old style Mercos. I had boxes of motors coming out of my ears and I wanted to test them all. So what I did is when I built this plane, and I'll do a little graphic on it, I came up with a system that I use to build a nose for what I hope is going to be a universal test plane and it's a good way to do it. Now in a typical crutch, what I want to know is I take all motors that I think I might be wanting to use and take the widest one. In this case, the ones I was testing, the Super Tiger 60 was the widest. And I mean, that, that left me the most room between the mounts. And if you look at this from the front, what I want to know is the distance, again, between the mounts of the widest motor that I'm going to want to test. And then I build a crutch, which I think is the way almost everybody builds fuselages now. It doesn't even pay to go into the dissertation about how else to do it. But by knowing that this is the widest it's ever going to be, now I can put in smaller motors. Well, I can always get the ears to hang out over here and put new holes in the bolts. And in the case of some of the 40s that I was testing, they were kind of thin, but they always had enough material I could get back out to where the Super Tiger holes were. It was never a problem. But what happens if you don't do that? You wind up having to put a big motor where a little one used to be. Now you wind up having to cut this out and you wind up with motor mounts that, that look like this and there's no material left here. The bolts don't fit. It really, it really weakens the nose to do that. Where if you use the biggest motor, you build a plane. Now you decide you want to put a smaller motor. Hey, it's going to require a little bit of machine work to get the holes level and straight. But once, if you use a smaller motor and then go to retrofit a wider motor, and I only mean in terms of width, you get into this leaving all the motor mount wood behind and it's really a problem. And we had a lot of years of fun testing, but we never had to chop the nose up really bad on this model. We, we just basically had to do the machine work on the motors to make them fit, and it was a very handy thing to do that takes no extra work. Now this is one of the planes that Russ Hunsberg had. And I, again, when I think of first flight and I think of trim, this is one of the ones I really I want to try to put as much of the good information I can on tape. What happened the day we tested this plane the first time, we didn't have the handle marked which side was up and down, and Russ had picked up the handle upside down, and of course the plane went in. We managed to fix it and bring it back to life, and that's another story of its own, but the significant thing is to have the plane, the handle, the lines, all pre-tested. Because what happens when you get down to the field, you're nervous to begin with. You don't want to waste good air, and you tend to rush things. So what I'm going to try to do later today, or if assuming we get some weather, I want to make up the lines, test the handle, mark up on the handle, get the safety thong, get all of those things ready and prepared so that when we actually do get down to the field, we hook up the lines, check up, check down, and we're ready to fly. We don't start doing that stuff when we get to the field. And that is the most excellent advice of all, is be prepared. And one of the most beautiful parts of this event, and I've been involved in a lot of other activities in my life, this is certainly a unique thing, is people tend to help each other. And these are two people that have been specifically helpful to me when we fly together, Billy will Bill Suarez, Mike Rogers, they'll always 
help you fine tune your plane. Th their advice and help are instrumental in making your equipment work. And a lot of times, that's hard to convince people. Is if you just go over and ask some of these people, you'd be surprised how many people are more than willing to help you in any way they can. That's the beauty of this event. And I think it's time to get that little guy out in the driveway and get some bench running on it, make up some lines, and get ready for this weekend. The weekend is coming. Well, it's been a long winter building this guy, and it has really been a fun model to build. I'm just hoping it's going to fly as good as it looks. Rudy Ryback's got his ready to fly. Woody Midgley has his ready to fly. And what we're all going to try to do over the, the oncoming season is get a lot of this on video, and maybe by the end of this year, have some really good numbers to work off and some good information that you can use if you want to build one of these. And I hope you do. In case this is the first video of the Brodak series you've ever seen, remember there's Brodak Nobler Construction, some real new, brand new videos on buffing. There's a lot of nice stuff. Make sure you take advantage of all the information that's available. This hobby is a really rewarding thing, but it can be frustrating when you don't have the right information at your fingertips. Take advantage of all the knowledge, and trim is just one area. nice things about building a same design or a similar design over and over is you find out things like when both of these planes were at their peak of trim they both wound up with almost exactly the same tip weight same lead out location pretty much the same uh, flap and elevator travel real close anyway even though they had a little bit different tails but you build a database to work off and what that helps you to do and in the case of a plane like the Brodak Cardinal hundreds of these are going to be built and it in as an ongoing thing we're going to have more and more information available as time goes by we're also going to have just like on a nobler you, know, you build a nobler you pretty much know the the trim will be pretty self-explanatory but there's always going to be little variations to custom tailor it to the person who's flying it Now before I even go outside, because it's still cold out there, this motor I had, since I had it in storage, I have what amounts to be after run oil in it. Now, another little tip before you go out to the field is I like to take a couple of drops of lighter fluid, just a couple, and just it clears out the after run oil before I put fuel in the tank even. It'll just get rid of that. I can do this right in the house because it's only going to run a one split second and that's it famous last words. In fact, most of it's already out of there. I don't even see any more coming out, but just to get all that after run oil out before you actually go, take it outside, and oh, the thing is fouling a plug and every other thing, so just a ni another nice little, yeah, that feels real good. We haven't run this motor yet, so again, how many times have I seen people, and uh, you get to the field, and now it's a beautiful day. So everybody wants to use a flying circle, and they get out there, and it's flip, 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 two million times, and you want to wring their neck by the time you go home. But this feels like a real nice little engine. I got a 10-6 prop on here for the break-in. I'm pretty much going to run it three or four times. Feels like it has real good compression. When a plane is new like this, everything... All the little things. Do the wheels spin? Again, I just go over and over and over and over in my mind. What are the little thing? Have I tightened the tank brackets? There's always a million little details to take care of. It really is fun getting out the first day of the year. You can see even in my driveway there's still snow here. <laughs> it really is something I look forward to every year but when a plane is new like this it's just uh, just something special about it hard to describe alright I want to get some fuel 
get it fueled up, get a couple of runs on this, and cut up some lines, handle, try to get prepared, charge the batteries. There's so many things to do that first day of the year. Well, I'm trying to trying to get at least a uh, oh, half an hour or so of running. You know, this is all fuel. That's another thing. I'm starting off the I'm starting off the year using up the old fuel. I got a half a gallon here, but you really should, when we get to the field, have new fuel. Well, it certainly sounds like a nice peppy little motor. Well, we're going to see. All we have to do now is wait for Saturday. Now, because the engine is new and all the bolts have just seated in, I'm just snugging each one up before I bother driving all the way up to the field and making people crazy. Muffler bolts usually after they heat and cool a few cycles. Could use a little more. I'll definitely pull a spinner and make sure the prop is tight. I don't want to go through even a tank mounts. I don't want to go through any aggravation. I don't have to. Once I get to the field, I'd like to. Let's hope. <laughs> Another good idea is since this is this plane has never really been waxed, is get a little automotive wax or final shine something on it just to protect it. In case we get out there and who knows, it'll be blazing sun, I'm sure. Hey, it looks like the weather's changing at last, and we're really, really looking forward. This is the time it really gets exciting, having a new plane. I think it's ready. Whenever I load up the car for the first time of a year, I always like to look and make sure I have all my spare lines, my solids, my braideds. In this case, I'm using 015, so I need to make up a couple of sets of 015s. And I need to get a spare handle that's got plenty of adjustment so I can get a kind of a dial in on the bell crank. And a couple of my little things that I use to my advantage is I always have a couple of sets of lines. I always mark which plane they're for, the total length. I mark the handle. And I always have a handle like this that has a lot of extra adjustments in it. Now, it seems like there's times you, you either buy a handle or you make a handle, and it's a lot of work to make these adjustments. But believe me, these are well worth it. These are the things that really pay big dividends. Now you can see on here I have marked a couple of places where 
under certain conditions I was using this adjustment on windy days or calm days or whatever these adjustments were. I have a little notebook and of course that's one of the other things. And here's a little red scratch here and a red scratch down here. But these are just things you want to have. A little notebook if possible. In this case we're, we're going to have a set of lines a little bit longer, a little bit shorter. Always leave the lines no matter what anybody says. N always on big reels. They don't kink at the end where they come through. Wow, is that a accident waiting to happen. I always take the line clips off. Whether you use a John Brodak reel or a Windy reel, it doesn't matter. The big reel does not kink the lines right at the end. I always leave the lines on the reel and I always put this tubing, this is ordinary fishing tubing, this, this doesn't let the lines unkink out at the handle. So this whole combination, this whole package is something that's really well worked out what I call bulletproof. These are the things that make a day at the field take as much possibility that you're going to have a problem out of it. Now I just want to mention handle adjustments. When a cable is coming out, and, I, and you should always start at what you think is a medium setting, especially if you're using, at this end of the control system, using a predetermined set of ratios. And you're using the ratios on the control horns. No sense making this too fancy, but what I'm getting at is there's a relationship here. Now, this relationship is how much movement you put into the handle over here. And boy, if you understand this, talk about having an advantage of being able to trim the plane. And out at this end, you have an amount of travel of the control system, flaps and elevators of course. And what it means is you can tailor it. Now you can use this amount of wrist action and you could probably measure that on a gauge to give you this amount of throw at the elevators. Now the problem is if you tailor this, this ratio or this ratio or this ratio, anytime you tinker with any of these ratios this comes into play as, as being something you've left out of the adjustment. If you want, I like to use, my own example, of use a standard bell crank, standard horns, these are all standard. Everything from this side of the handle on is standard. Everything from this part of the handle out is custom. This is made to a general standard that fits most people most of the time. This is custom. This you have to custom tailor to your own flying style level ability. And as you move this cable into the further and further adjustments out this way, you're going to have more corner. It's going to be more sensitive. Now, as you move, you lengthen this arm. Now, some handles have a bar in front which makes moving it closer to your knuckles not possible. But regardless, if you make these arms longer, as you make the arms longer and longer, you lose leverage. And as you lose leverage, what happens? The plane gets more and more difficult. So if it's a bigger and bigger plane, it gets more difficult to turn. Short arms when you can make the arms as short as possible, this is power steering. When you want more power steering effect, you want to be able to just move the plane quickly. You want to make the arms as short as physically possible. Now you can even get carried away with this, and I've done this many times. When I wanted to make an F2B where hard cornering is the Vogue thing, I even cut the arms back so that I could still get my hand in it. Now imagine if, if you will, this in, the, in its full travel is giving you a lot more leverage. A lot more leverage. You're not, as this, as this arm gets longer, you lose leverage. The object for me is to get this arm as short as physically possible. You can picture in your mind, this long arm handles, this would be appropriate for small planes. And there actually would be an advantage to the long arms because you would you would lose that tendency to over control. But on big ships, 
This is what the relationship looks like. Smaller the ship, longer arms. Big ships, shorter arms. When you want power steering, you need short arms on the handle. They need to be as short as possible. And of course, this allows you also with the the availability of all those choices of control. If the plane doesn't turn equally, not only can you adjust it at the elevator, you can adjust it at the handle. But just keep in mind what some of the choices are. Opening the handle up makes the plane turn sharper, more sensitive, harder to fly. Pulling them closer together, it's going to be more stable and level flight, have less tendency to bobble. But again, all of this, a handle is a custom item. You might not be comfortable picking up my handle. I may not be comfortable picking up your handle. It's a custom thing that has to be tailored to the person flying. Another thing I'm going to do later today, I'm just going to make a good suggestion. At the beginning of every season, I replace all the handle cables. If a handle is adjusted for one plane, it wears at one spot constantly. And it's the cheapest insurance in the world to replace the handle cable and crimps at the beginning of every season. On all my handles, I sit down and in 15 minutes, I have all of these replaced. Also, another handy item to have is a good old 100 foot ruler. Now you can tell I've been on a budget for a long time. I duct taped these pieces together when this got dropped. Anyway, I'm due for a new ruler. Anybody out there wants to buy me a ruler? Anyway, Christmas is coming. Having a, ca a new, new Cables, so important. More people lose a plane because the cable will break right here and they've used it for season after season and never adjusted it. It's less prone to happen when you adjust the handle back and forth. But in my case, I have handles and lines all set for each plane individually and they never change. Once they're set, they're set for life. And we're out at the field for the, the ship's first couple of flights. What I did, I put a couple of, no, we couldn't do stunt patterns for you, the first day was too rough. I put about 15, 20 minutes of footage on another tape so I can go home and reference off of this to try to show some of the things I was trying to accomplish. What we did find out was, number one, the plane was excellent, absolutely excellent, and real close thanks to the bench trimming. A couple of things that it needed, and we did these on a, on a previous tape, we shim the tank almost as high as it would go. You can see how far off center it is. And we're going to be getting a smaller tank. That tank is too big. I'm going to get John Brodak to send me a four ounce. That was one thing. Number two, it seemed like it was burning about three ounces of fuel, three and a half to do a flight. The 10.6 had a little bit too much pitch. It's going to need a lower pitch prop. Tongue muffler worked perfect. The Bill Mazzoni tongue muffler, perfect right off the bat. The leadouts look like you're going to need to go back just a little bit. Again, I have some flying footage that I can reference. I was doing some aches and things to try to dial in the uh, engine. And we'll try to do that later on in the tape, try to just show of what value you can put a video to. In the meantime, I think we're just going to pack it in here. The wind is getting almost unflyable here. What I always do is on the way back from the flying session, go over in my mind the things I have on my list to change. In this case, one of the things I wanted to do, because what had already happened is the tank wound up shimming out, at least on this initial day with that prop and everything, so high, I need a little bit of a, t a trim tab on the outboard bottom wing to compensate for it. That may change, and I've just taped that on in place. The real, the real culprit here is that this weight is way above the center of gravity. Now that may change. We don't know if that's going to be a permanent part of the way this plane is trimmed yet. Now, the things we came to conclusion of, the 10-6 prop, a little bit too much pitch for a cold day like this. Remember, on a hot day this might be real nice, but on a cold day, less pitch. But we didn't really have time with the weather and everything to do any fine tuning. The muffler worked out almost perfect motor was very friendly and easy to needle. Wheel pants worked out real nice. Usually you know right away if a plane is going to track or not track. In this case the plane is so light that it's difficult to even land it on a, on a day when the wind is really howling like this. I'm not only a little extra tip weight but I'm also going to go back about another quarter of an inch 
on each one of the readouts so that the mean average point is a quarter of an inch back. Just a little bit more stability. The reason for this is the plane has a super corner. The plane has an unbelievable corner. We certainly don't need more corner. So to, to kill some of the corner, fine tune it. I'm going to move that just a little bit back. And as of, as of right now, there's no no need at all for hinge line tape. A plane this weight and has that thick of a wing really has no need for any kind of hinge line tape. Although we will experiment with it in the future. Right now, it's not one of the things we need to do. Now remember the general rule, cold air, low pitch, warm air, high pitch. Now we know this is a good prop. This is probably going to be an excellent prop for really nice warm air. And we want to test the two blades. We want to test the three blades. We've got a lot of stuff to test. But we know for sure that for now, this is the prop that has the most pitch. And we were going a little bit faster in this cold air. Remember, the cold air is dense. I want to take out one of the other lower pitch props that we have. In fact, we have an 11.5. This is an 11.5 BYNO for the next day of testing. Sometimes it's really a little difficult to figure out when you want to change things. Do you want to change the venturi size? Do you want to change the compression? Do you want to change the prop? But usually the easiest one to change is the prop. So in this case, we know we're making more than enough power. You can tell just from looking at some of the footage that we've taken. And now that we have a bunch of that footage available, now it makes it real easy for us. Well, now we're in the driver's seat. We can go look at that footage any time, day or night, sit and analyze the motor run. Do we want to go faster? Do we want to go slower? Does the motor sound like it's overburdened? In this case, certainly a 10.6 on a 40 is not going to overburden it. But as always, we have the whole bag of props, and we'll be testing them all. I even have that one three blade that came in the mail. Now, I just want to demonstrate some of the things you can pick up off of videotape. This will only take a minute or two. This is some of the footage that we shot today. Now, every day that I go flying, I, I shoot footage. I come back, typically like now, I'll look at... I'll turn the sound down even so I don't hear background noises. And I just, I want to get some gut impressions of the plane. Now normally, because of the dark background and because this is a yellow plane or a light colored plane, I can almost get a real good gauge off the wing, being level. I certainly can see if a plane is turning as tight as I expect it to turn or not turning tight enough. In this case, I can see the wing is up inverted just a little bit, and I've made that correction with the tab. The turn, if anything, was a little harder on the outside. We can adjust that with the handle, but the overall turn was plenty, absolute plenty, plenty tight. You can see the corners are very, very hard. The plane was flying fast, basically because the weather was real cold. Anytime it's cold, you're going to get increased speeds. Motors make more power. Props typically bite a lot better. Now we were, here's the other point too, right? whenever I do consecutive maneuvers there's a reason for it and what I was doing here is just going around and around and trying to determine if I was getting an even motor run. At this point in time we were still moving the tank higher and higher. Now what I wanted to determine, anytime you see a, a bunch of consecutive maneuvers exactly the same, what I'm trying to determine is something in there that I can either identify that the motor is doing or that the ship is doing and by doing it over and over again I can figure that out a lot easier than just doing one per pattern. Now here's another time if you look real close here if you have a slow-mo you can see that the wing is up even on the outside part of the squares. Again the video is so helpful when doing this. Yeah, In fact I hear Kyle in the background here talking. But anyway Anytime you get a chance to shoot video, video is a real helpful thing in working out some of the problems. Now here, we're doing a lot of round eights back to back. I can hear the engine brake. What I'm looking for is the engine brake to be the same here as, say, from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock on both sides equally. Or if it isn't braking, that it's staying in the same speed for those, both sides. And in this case, I still needed to speed up the outside part of it. 
Now I see Kyle was having trouble following us. Now a lot of times, a day like today, you think, well, it's just a blowout day and you're not going to get much accomplished, but that's not true. You can always learn, even from this basic, basic, this type of footage where you just can pick up big, gross errors. Now we picked up that the handle was too big right away, that the tank was way out of shim. The leadouts were a little too far forward. When you have a really violent turn like this, usually the leadouts are too far forward. That's one of the indications. In this case, we're going to go back to using the, the bigger prop with less pitch. And in fact, we'll watch this video three or four times and see what else we can pick up and make a couple more mental notes. But always good to have as much footage on video, consecutive maneuvers. Anything you can pick up off the video is well worthwhile. Based on the information that we picked up off of that little video, the few flights that we did shoot, basically another thing I want to do is slow down the speed, and this is an 11 inch 5 BYNO for the next set of tests, the next weekend, next time we get out to fly, and we're going to do this on an ongoing basis to try to, well, get as much information as we can on this tape that will help you, assuming that you're interested in putting this right into your own program or if you're just interested in knowing it or just comparing it to some of the other systems that are around that seem to work well I think we're going to uh, just do this on an ongoing basis each weekend and let's hope we get some better weather for the next session Oh, right at Middlesex here it's a reasonable day, but certainly not a great day. And I thought the first thing we'd want to do is get some of these props tested. The first flight we took today, Kyle took a flight with the 11.5 BYNO. That was real close to being right. I feel real happy with that so far. But we have some APCs to try, and we have the one three-blade Bengali to try. So I want to get started rotating different props onto the plane while we have some decent air here. And the 10.6 was just a little bit on the fast side. 11.5 was there. Actually, we have an 11.3, too. Before the day's over, we'll try that one, too. Now, what we've done is recruit a whole bunch of different people to fly the plane. Already today, we've had Carlos Serra take a few flights. He broke our 11.5 BYNO. <laughs> This is the APC-10-5. One of the major problems we've had so far, in fact, it's the biggest problem in trimming this plane was getting the tank to shim out equally upright and inverted. And I ran out of adjustment. So what I'm suggesting is if you set one of these up with this motor, you're really going to have to go much higher than the center line of the motor if you have an inch and a quarter tank. A one-inch tank, of course, that dimension will be less. So I can't get this to shim out equally, and that's the next thing we're going to have to work on. We're going to have to work on a different tank setup. Anyway, we've gotten to see it with this prop. I think what he's going to tell me when... And this is what's good about having a lot of test pilots, that he'd like to slow the plane down a little bit. And if that's the case... We're going to try, we have an 11.3 BYNO, the 11.4 slowed it down, we have an 11.3. We also have a three-bladed prop. Again, let's get back to seeing the plane. We wound up making the trim tab a little bit bigger. Now the trim tab is there to counteract the fact that that, and it's on the early part of this video, that that tank is much higher than the engine, it throws the vertical CG way off. So until we get the thinner one-inch tank on here, we're going to have to live with that trim pad, at least for now. The plane has a pretty, even with a small handle, a pretty nice clean corner. Kyle's been getting more test flying on it than I have. And this is what's good about having a young guy do the test flying. You can keep the old guys safely at bay wiping a plane off for you. The wing is almost level here, I guess as close as we're going to get it. And I guess we'll spend the rest of the day trying some of these other prop combinations. But ultimately what's going to make this plane better is going to be another tank. 
and we hope we can get that information within another couple of days by next weekend maybe. But for a new plane, this is only the second day out at the field. I think it's trimming in, coming in, roughing in, whatever you want to call it. And to only have one real idiosyncrasy to deal with at this point in time is, is really an asset. And Kyle, of course, is a really talented flyer. I expect him to be very competitive at any contest he goes to. But as we see more and more of these being built, Rudy Rybeck's Sabatino's is almost ready to go. We can get a couple more versions of the plane at different weights with different power plants. Rudy's got a double star 40. Sabatino has the same motor. And again, a lot of it is just, it's just going to come from getting a lot of test flights. Generally, what the pits look like during one of these spin sessions. Just a bunch of junk laying all over the floor. Oh, and the next thing I want to try here, we have a uh, ten and a half, four and a half. The one that's on there is a ten five. So this will be a little more diameter and a little less pitch, and I think that'll be the next the next test when it's all turned into flying order again. Okay, this is going to be a little flight on the ten and a half, four and a half. A quick tip: anytime you use an APC, a nylon, a actually any prop, I use these on my finger. It's an old tune pipe connector, and it works. Piece of garden hose will work, but boy, you sure don't want to get your finger in by one of those APC props. Boy, that is. But it's definitely not fun. Hey, one of these days we gotta wipe this plane off, you know. One of you guys, <laughs> one of you big volunteers has to get the not right. No, don't wipe it with alcohol. Now what Kyle is doing between flights is wiping the wiping the lines with alcohol, which is a good idea whether you have braided or solids or whatever. Good old 90%, 91% alcohol, but you really don't want to get any of that alcohol on a plane. That can really ruin your whole day. That will that will act almost like paint remover. Now the reason for cleaning the lines is a lot of times you have an old set of lines that's binding and you hear you are trying to put nose weight in the plane to make up for the fact that the lines are sticking. That's a very old, very old problem. things we're going to try to do sooner or later. We want to try adding a quarter of an ounce, a half ounce or so in nose weight, and then try flying it with the spinner off to see where we like the CG. But it looks like we're real close right now, so I haven't found, I haven't considered that to be one of the things that needed to be looked at. It looked real close, and the only thing we've been fooling with is this tank motor has been kind of nice. Actually, real nice friendly motor. Really nice friendly motor. I did not expect it to be that friendly. I was expecting it to be a little more of a job. Haven't seen an awful lot of people with Schnirly 40s have problems with them. I think then we have head gaskets. We haven't even put head gaskets in yet. Boy, if you know one thing, never flip one of these APC props barehanded. What a mistake that can be. Now, for anybody that doesn't know, we, we have a continuing set of ongoing set of videos of trimming this plane. It's going to be available when we actually get to fine tune it and get many, many other people to fly it. But everybody that flies it, let's hope, is going to give us some real feedback. And we hope this is going to become a uh, very usable plane, very user-friendly plane. So virtually anybody can build a kit. Not a difficult plane to build, very easy to build.
motor has a real nice friendly characteristic. And I think once we get some props really fine tuned in. Now my first choice was the 11.5 BYNO so far. That was the first, the 11.5 and the 11.4 BYNO were real friendly. This one looks like a good second choice. And what the APC props do, it's not a big high-tech secret, they load the motor very lightly so that the motor tends not to run hot. And one of the problems with Schnurley motors is when they get hot, of course they go lean and don't come back to rich. So you really can't, you can't run a Schnurley motor like you run a Fox or a Tiger where it's grunting and groaning. You, you must keep the prop load very light, low pitch, relatively low diameter. And that's one of the one of the things we'd like to add when we, we get plenty of flights on this, and we'll publish it in Stunt News, is a full setup. And I really appreciate that Kyle is keeping the bottoms high because we're in some turbulent air here. This air can be funky. But we're going to try to do this over the course of this summer. And maybe by the end of the summer, publish a little thing in Stunt News of what we found worked real well. Because it's applicable to a lot of other planes like the Warbird series, the Nobler. And it really is a nice, nice little plane to fly. This has been, for me, a nice change of pace from having these really uh, labor intensive deals. The plane has a real nice clean top on the hourglass, which is one of the a pleasant surprise. And next week we're going to try to get Joe Adamusco to be our test pilot of the day. We recruit as many people as we can. Homogenize the feedback from them. And it's funny how other people can... Uh, yep! They were running out of fuel here. We spent so much time on this thing cleaning the filter and I probably didn't yeah I know I didn't fill a tank I've been cleaning that filter on every flight now here's a really good tip at the end of a flight don't get carried away and start doing vertical ace or something that can that can hurt you until we get the fuel I was playing with this on the ground of probably over a minute of course, each time I change the prop, the, and the plane lands itself. It's just beautiful. Anybody that blows a landing with this deserves to pay for pizza. You like that prop? Now from this selection of props, the conclusion so far is still that the, uh, the big BYNO seems to be the prop of choice. A little bit better line tension. You like the line tension better with the, uh, the BYNO, huh, Kyle? Right. Okay. Well, th these all these all look pretty close. I like the BYNO best too. The motor's really got a scream to. Uh, yeah. It'll it might be too slow. I don't know. That's the only way we're going to find out. If it's too slow, then get it out of there. I'm not going to know one. Way. Yeah, because he sold a lot of these engines, so we might as well find out what works for Yeah, but a lot of guys don't do the testing. They buy one right. drop and then they get to go flying. Is that battery around here, Tom? Yeah. Good.
know. 180 degrees. Yeah. Let's shift it again. This is uh, 11 4, I think it is. It is? Alright. Uh, yeah. I'm sure we have the airspeed with this prop. Let's see what's happening. Seems like it's breaking. Not as much. Having to really rev it up to get it going. I mean, it's really. It looks like it's out there though. A little bit more line tension than last time. Yeah, definitely like that BYNO 11.5 better. That was the best of the bunch so far. Let's hope it doesn't stop. Holy cow. That was nerve wracking. The big thing is to be able to get with Joe and maybe build a cardinal from scratch and you'll learn a lot from that. Oh, it went degrees in this landing. Yeah. Oh! Almost as good as you, almost! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a whole day of flying here. The prop we've kind of really liked the most is the 11.5 and 11.4 BYNO. Keep in mind this is a totally stock engine, no head gaskets, no ventilators inserted. Nothing tricky, nothing hard to, uh, no rework at all, right from John Brodak, out of the box, and in the plane. And except for getting the tank shin, the only really Mickey Mouse again is that getting that tank to zeroed in, and that, that has yet to be finished. We seem to like this prop. This is the 11.4 BYO. Seems to work pretty good. He's got line tension. Or he needs it. Something weird going on. Well, one of the things I've been trying to do is in between flights, constantly monitor this trim tab because I want to make the adjustment the adjustment with the tank shim 
and that tab go hand in hand. I think we put that right on the uh, the beginning of this video before we ever even shot the video. But I want to constantly make sure that I've got that in equilibrium. Now, what happened is Daryl was watching one of the flights, and he says, now it's in upright flight, it's a little bit up. Well, now I can just take it and bend a little bit of that out. Now, see, if, you had, if you're trying to tweak eighth-inch horns, mm, you really don't want to do that, especially at the field where you can't do a repair if you have to. All right, let's try it again.
Well, because we've had so much trouble with this tank not being able to shim it exactly the way we want, what I've tried to do just to mask the problem is run two fuel filters. You can see that worked okay. And that masked over the problem just a little bit, but it isn't a cure. It really isn't a cure for what we're looking for in terms of motor run. You can see what happened to the wheel pant. This is what typically happens uh, when you fly on a rough field. It takes a beating. Now it's a real war veteran. And also that little bit of extra tip weight I had put in the last time I was back at the shop. Didn't need it. We're right back to the original amount of tip weight and that was fine. Now at the end of every day what I like to do is try the things. I make a little list of what I want to try the next day. In this case, I made up another tank, another tank bracket. I wanted to try this muffler because one of the things this muffler is going to do is change the vertical CG and minimize the need for that tab on the outboard wing. How much of this weight lies below the center of gravity? Now, another thing I could do if I wanted to fine tune this is mills, put this in a milling machine and just shave some of this off until this gave me exactly the right vertical CG. Again, these are the things that uh, you know, little by little you work on when you have a plane. I have an air filter now. I can put the air filter on and off. Air filter on gives you a little better mileage. It, in effect, makes the Venturi a little smaller. Air filter off, a little more power, a little less mileage. Now, of course, the green one is more fine than the black one, so you could have both, and then you could have a setting somewhere in between each one. But now what it also gives us is the original tank that we had can become the backup tank. So we'll have a spare tank, and we're going to make even one more tank, or maybe more, before we finish that part of the fine tuning. Now while we're talking about mileage, just one of the other thoughts. I started out that original tank is five ounces, this one is four and a half, and the one Woody's going to make is four. And I like to keep the tank as short as possible. In this case I've got it butted almost right up on the engine. I even had to shorten the, the little vents. But again, it's always the best to have a tank as close to the engine as possible. A tank further back here can give you an erratic engine run for no reason at all. Now I also did some work with props. I located a bunch more, some 12 fours, some 11 fours, 11 fives. One of the things that we have a really excellent prop video. That's one you should be checking out if you want uh, well, whatever information you can get from it. It should be able to save you a lot of hours. Now, in the course of trimming, back and forth, back and forth, when I had the tongue muffler on, I had moved the leadouts well, a quarter inch at a time to see if I could find anything that amounted to be in like a sweet spot. And where these wound up was about a quarter of an inch from the end of the travel. Any further forward than this and the plane just got unnecessarily touchy, at least with the trim that we had on on the last day of flying. But again, this can always change, and this is the reason you'd like to have, if possible, variable leadouts. Another thing, too, as the plane little by little wears in, what happens, the controls get smoother and smoother. In this case, they're really nice and smooth already. But one of the things, even though I don't suspect this plane will need tape hinge lines, one of the tests that I always would want to make is to tape the hinge lines, fly the plane, right at the field take the tape off, and see if I like it better taped or untaped. Now, typically planes use or take advantage of hinge line tape when they're a little bit on the heavy side. When they're on the light side, they don't really seem to benefit that much from it, but it never hurts to try. And the hinge line tape rule is the 90% rule. What happens is about 90% of the planes will benefit some from having the hinge lines taped. And the 10% that don't benefit, nothing bad happens. You fly a day, two days, go home, and just take the tape off. And this way you have the best of all possible worlds. And that's one of the things we'll be doing in the future. Now obviously, in a two hour tape, you don't have time for every single thing that could be tried, tested, changed. But I've tried to give a reasonable account of how I went about the first couple of days of trimming this plane. And you can see from some of the flights, we, we really do have a real good ballpark set up within the first couple of days. Several other people got to fly the plane, and this is, this is the bottom line. If other people can fly your plane, it's probably in pretty good trim. 
when you're the only one that can fly your plane, it probably isn't in such great trim, and then maybe you know you're not the world beater uh, airplane you think it is. So my feeling always is get a lot of people to do the test piloting, and this is one of the things that uh, in the near future, the follow-up videos to this one, we're going to be having as many people as possible. We're going to be going out to John Brodak's contest. Hopefully everybody that flies the plane will give us some reasonable feedback. We'll have several mufflers to try. I always prefer putting a heavier, a lighter muffler on the plane rather than weight on the flywheel. We always have the option of just taking the wheel pants right off, putting on heavier wheels. Another choice we have for flying over grass, if nothing else. A lot of good choices, and I guess the bottom line with all trim is to have all the choices all the time, especially right at the field, have backup systems for everything. And you should, sure and most of all, get somebody who's higher up on the skill level than you are to help you every step of the way. Now in the near future, we're going to be putting out several, several really exciting, interesting new videos in conjunction with John Brodak and his line of kits. Check in regularly. Needless to say, always have the latest Brodak catalog available. And if you don't have access to any of the technology and you need help, even on a personal basis, please drop me a line and I'll try to help in any way I can. Now I really have dedicated the better part of my adult life, over 45 years now, to documenting, putting down on videotape and in flying models, stunt news, in the columns in model aviation, the things that I've learned, and I'm always, always more than happy to help. All you need to do is ask.